Okay, a tutorial on pelt shade junctions. Uh, these are just a truly fascinating component you can purchase, uh, basically converting uh, heat uh, to either electricity or converting electricity uh, to a thing which can move heat around. Very simple setup here, just a, a pelt shade junction and a thermometer on each side of the junction and a, a lab power supply. And I turn it on uh, and the magic begins. Uh, one side gets hotter and one side gets colder and basically this device is pumping heat from one side to the other uh, with of course no moving parts, no refrigeration and that is neat. Um, now of course um, you can see the temperature is dropping slowly and uh, you can get your first lesson in thermodynamics uh, by of course getting enthused and saying well obviously more current uh, will produce a greater temperature change and absolutely so you uh, might be tempted to crank up your power supply in your lab and you can see a, a rapid change in temperature, now almost uh, 10 degrees between the two sides. And of course, you need to crank it even further because you get more excited. Um, now uh, you can see 36 degrees, uh, 20 degrees, and then you'll crank it again. And uh, you'll find eventually uh, you run into an interesting uh, bit of thermodynamics 50 degrees, 70 degrees, almost spiraling out of control, 17 degrees. And all of a sudden now both sides start to heat and what's happened is basically uh, the hot side of this device can't reject the heat into the environment fast enough um, and then it slowly starts creeping back into the other side of the device and both will start warming up and I'll just turn it off because I don't want to damage this junction. Uh, basically though you can't sort of run a Peltier junction just like this, it doesn't do a lot of meaningful work. Whoa, 90 degrees, whoa. Okay. This is a heat sink, uh, basically a chunk of aluminum uh, with lots and lots of surface area, and that's very important. That's the uh, way a heat sink takes energy and rejects it into the uh, the atmosphere uh, because clearly uh, the heat is pumped from the Peltier junction uh, onto the metal, and then the metal will reject that into the atmosphere. Uh, otherwise, the metal simply would heat up without limitation. The other thing that's really critical in this application is something like a thermal compound or a thermal grease, um, very commonly purchased in uh, little jars like this, and uh, often white. You need a, a very, very thin coat. You're just trying to uh, cover up the um, imperfections in metal, and uh, I'm sure people on the internet will be now screaming at me because I have probably a little bit too much. Um, this, is our, this is not a really high thermal application, so um, you don't have to be super obsessive over it, uh, but certainly uh, try to keep it to a, uh, a limit. And uh, the heat sink on, the Peltier Junction, and uh, turn it back on, we'll find that uh, we can pump uh, considerably uh, more uh, energy now. In the handy tip section, uh, this white grease seems to go just everywhere, unless you have uh, something to wipe it off with. Uh, these little uh, serviettes seem to be just exceptionally good at dissolving this uh, material so it vanishes quickly so your wife doesn't scream at you about all the white fingerprints around the house. Don't ask me how I know about that. Okay, uh, so here I have the uh, heat sink, the Peltier Junction facing cold side up and you can see the power supply is turned on and the amperage is set to a much higher limit than it was when the cell was just sitting by itself. And you can see, of course, the temperature comes down uh, quite dramatically. We'll get uh, well into the negative numbers. Now, the heat sink isn't the most advantageous position because all of these little fins are sitting down, and uh, obviously heat can't be rejected very efficiently. And if I wait long enough, what will happen is eventually the uh, Peltier cooler will uh, warm this piece of aluminum up to the point where um, it's not a really effective heat sink. And uh, to make this kind of construction more effective, the, the next step, of course, is forced air cooling. And... Uh, very common to see a, f a fan added to a heat sink like this to blow air onto it. And as the air moves quickly across the fins, uh, it increases the ability for this heat sink to uh, reject energy outwards. Okay, so um, the scenario now changes with a fan pushing air onto this heat sink. And of course, I've got a little air gap here so I can draw enough uh, air. And uh, this is sort of the next step in terms of improving the ability for a heat sink to remove heat and um, this would be quite dramatically good actually. Okay, well this is essentially an infinite heat sink. Uh, what we have here is a hose of course attached to a sink and a, a metal box and that's all that's inside this is just simply a, a metal enclosure and as I turn the water on of course the water will run through the box 
And when it's doing that, essentially, it, it's carrying away the heat. And, of course, the heat-carrying capacity of water is incredible. And because it's being constantly replenished with uh, fresh water, um, you can essentially drive fairly significant power levels out of this box. So, now, this shouldn't be a surprise if anyone's uh, played with water cooling on a personal computer, um, which is uh, very popular now. The water tends to be recycled in those uh, scenarios. Here, of course, actually, we're going to reject heat uh, through the water, and there's no need for a radiator, kind of open-loop system. Uh, if you build a system, um, this is a vacuum break, that's pretty important. Uh, you don't want stale water coming back into your uh, uh, system. But um, this is a very practical way of cooling really high energy loads. Um, in fact, IBM used it in the mainframes in the 60s uh, quite extensively. Okay, well here's the water cooling running and the thermocouple is recording about minus 12 degrees on top of the uh, junction. And of course, this is the lowest temperature yet, and that's not a surprise. The, the water coming from the top is cooler than room temperature as well. And uh, it's an incredibly efficient heat sink, so I've turned my power supply up quite considerably. I'm drawing about uh, 25 watts on it. Um, so basically, the paltry junction is pumping out know, significant amounts of heat. Uh, let's turn off the hose here. Uh, quite noisy. But um, a, really, a, a really an amazingly effective way of building a high-powered heat sink. In terms of where to buy Peltier Junctions, uh, easily procured through uh, Chinese vendors uh, via Amazon or um, eBay. If you don't mind waiting about six weeks for them to come in, they can be had for not very much money, eight, ten dollars. Uh, if you're a little bit more uh, anxious, uh, onshore distributors like uh, Mauser and uh, DigiKey carry a, a pretty extensive selection. Uh, heat sinks, you can buy them too, uh, and fans, but uh, often these can be very easily salvaged out of old personal computers, uh, a really uh, rich source of uh, heat sinking materials. Uh, in terms of this uh, little box here, uh, it's known as a cold plate, and uh, this particular one I constructed out of just simply an experimenter's box. Uh, I think it's a Hammond manufactured box. I uh, got it out of DigiKey, and I just simply uh, epoxied on some uh, PEX fittings, and then uh, use some uh, conductive hose. You can see there's not much going, inside, going on inside this box. Uh, you can get quite sophisticated with uh, f baffles and fans and uh, even potentially mounting a heat sink on this side of the plate to uh, to get a very efficient transfer of uh, heat uh, from the metal through the, the water. So there we have it. Uh, just a short uh, video on some sort of practical ways of uh, using Peltier junctions and some of the heat sinking techniques that you'll need in order to get a meaningfully cold side on them.